I'm Maureen and I'm part of the ministry team at Wick St Fergus Church. I feel really privileged to be part of the Wick St Fergus community again, sharing the preaching of God's word. I say the word again because I set, spent my second placement with the Reverend John Nugent in 2017. For six months I shadowed John, going into care homes, visiting parishioners and meeting up in Weatherspoons for coffee to discuss theology and approaches to ministry. John trusted me with his pulpit and allowed me to lead worship regularly, which really helped me develop my own style and for that I thank him. I was then set apart to the Word by the Church of Scotland in February 2018 and since then I've been travelling all over the county covering pulpits for ministers when they went on holiday and leading worship on a Sunday at churches where there was no minister in place. Churches, as you've probably seen, have moved into the world of online worship and prayers. And Wick St Fergus will be doing that as well, alongside the more traditional church services, as soon as coronavirus restrictions allow. While I'm comfortable with technology, I have to come right out and say I am not a fan of all that goes on in social media. And that's got nothing to do with my age. I can really see the benefits of people using social media to keep in touch, support friends and family, and keep up to date with the news. And we'll certainly be using the church's Facebook page and website to help you keep up to speed with what's happening in the church and how you can get involved. But there's two sides to social media. There's the loving, communicating, caring use of it by many, and that I really like. And then there's the manipulative, corrupt, bullying, abuse of it by others. And what I'm seeing too often these days is venting. Letting rip with unfiltered thoughts and concepts that just spew out from someone sitting anonymously behind a laptop, secure in the knowledge that no one knows their real name. There's too much threat against women, against anyone whose views don't agree with the trolls. We've even seen death threats being made to people who are just doing their jobs. And those two faces of social media reminded me in a sort of roundabout way of how we see Jesus. We see him as the Lamb, the Lamb of God, or, as St John said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. We're all familiar with that image of Jesus, and that makes me feel secure and safe. The part of scripture I want to focus on today is Jesus at the temple in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. Here we see a different image of Jesus. The lamb became the lion, and that lion was not the soft and cuddly tame pet. The Bible makes reference to the lion of the tribe of Judah. The lion and the lamb are two images and names for God used in scripture that describe aspects of Jesus Christ. The aspects of Jesus are as powerful and majestic as a lion and as innocent as a sacrificial lamb. In John chapter 2 we read that it was the time of Passover, the time when every Jewish male went to the temple in Jerusalem to remember and to give thanks. When they got there they had to pay a temple tax but they all arrive with different currencies, just like we arrive at an airport with sterling and have to change it to euros or dollars. And just as today we see the Bureau de Change, the money changers then were at the temple to exchange these coins. They, as you would expect, charged a rate for their services. But it was an exchange rate that fleeced the poor and demonstrated a level of social injustice that we still see time and time again today. In order to fulfil the requirements of the law, it was necessary for the pilgrims to make sacrifices. The law was that any animal offered in sacrifice must be perfect and unblemished. The temple authorities had appointed inspectors to check the animals that were to be offered. 
There was, of course, a fee for their services, and it was, to all intents and purposes, more or less certain that the animal would be rejected as unacceptable for a sacrifice to God. That might not have mattered much, but animals for sacrifice could cost at least 15 times more inside the temple as outside. The poor, the majority, either had to borrow the money to, bring, to buy their offerings or they had nothing to sacrifice. The choice was either to get into debt to fulfil the religious obligations or default on them finding themselves classified among the sinners and be excluded from the number of the righteous. In this scene, we see that this time of Passover, of remembering, remembering liberation from slavery in Egypt, was being used to exploit, marginalise and exclude. No laws were necessarily being broken by these temple practices. But in the very place of divine encounter, the spirit of the law, the love of neighbour, was being denied. Jesus was justifiably angry. He became the lion. In the midst of a mass of people, money changing tables, animals milling about, we can presume that the doves, the symbol of peace, flew away and were safe. But the cattle and sheep took a bit more directing. And so Jesus made a whip of cords to encourage them to move out of the area. Then he dealt with the money exchangers and the money lenders before he finally overturns their tables. Take these things away, he said. You mustn't turn my father's house into a market. This is a thorough clearing out of everything that acts as a barrier to accessing God. You can just imagine the anger of Jesus as he attacks the corruption of a place of worship. His anger at the treatment of the poor who had trekked for miles and miles to come to worship God in the temple. The corruption he saw amongst the priestly elite who held huge civil authorities as Roman puppets and whose hypocrisy and disregard for the poor struck a raw nerve in Jesus. But something to note in this piece of scripture, that the anger Jesus poured out was not like a flash of temper. It was not that boiling rage that I'm sure we have sometimes felt. No, Jesus made a whip out of cords. He didn't have one with him. He saw what was happening and he must have sat down or cleared a space for himself so that he could fashion a whip out of a bunch of cords which were just long lengths of rope. This was controlled anger. This was anger that focused on one thing and then it was wielded with great authority. It was righteous anger. Here is the lion and a a ferocious one at that and not the lamb. He is the lion who is zealous to redeem his people, to take hearts and souls distracted from the glory of God and to restore them to God. So what are we to make of this in our lives today? Do we allow our anger at perceived social injustice boil over into actions that couldn't possibly please God? And the riot at Capitol Hill in America recently was the perfect illustration of the mob taking social action to the extreme. They thought they were justified in taking the action they did. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong to be angry about social injustice. But it is wrong to think we have the right to let this powerful emotion hurt other people. We've seen time and time again people taking the law into their own hands and feeling justified in doing so. We've seen time and time again abusive and threatening language appearing in social media and those abusers feel justified in venting their feelings. The authority to judge other people is given to our court system, not to individuals or groups of vigilantes with guns and sticks or those who vent their fury 
on social media. Jesus had God's authority, something we don't have. People who pass such severe judgments on other people are wrong. They don't act with the authority of God. While we want to live like Christ, we should never try to claim his authority where it has not been given to us. We are humans and we do judge other people, no matter how hard we try not to. But we just don't have the authority to do that. We are commanded to love our neighbours as we love ourselves, even when it's hard, even when we find it impossible. But love isn't a perfect state of caring. It's an active noun, like struggle, like perseverance, like effort. To love someone is to struggle to love that person exactly as we are right now. That's our task not to take on an authority we haven't been given by God. But Jesus took the evil acts in the temple as an insult against God, and as a result, he didn't deal with them half-heartedly. He was consumed with righteous anger against such open disrespect for God. This little passage in scripture provides a wonderful insight into the character of God. He is both loving and gentle, like the lamb, but he can also be the lion who lets his displeasure be seen, loud and clear. But what are we to do? We so, see so many situations where we know things are just not right. We see decisions being made without thought to the long-term effects of government policy. We see a rise in mental health problems, a rise in homelessness, children going hungry, and so many other concerns. What's to be done about it? Well, we can exercise our right to peaceful protest, either in demos or in writing to newspapers and politicians, not just once, but repeatedly until you get an answer. We can, if we can afford it, give some money to, monies to charities that directly help the poor and the vulnerable through food banks, food box deliveries, lunch boxes for kids. We can all, rich or poor, certainly reach out a hand to someone who is struggling and show them a little kindness and a bit of help. And lastly, we can pray. No matter the person praying, the passion behind the prayer or the purpose of the prayer, God answers prayers that are in agreement with his will. His answers are not always yes, but they are always in our best interest. His answers don't always come on a time scale that we can be part of but his answers will come in time. When we pray passionately and purposefully according to God's will, God responds powerfully. With that, will you pray with me? Almighty God, tender as a lamb and as powerful as a lion, guide us when we feel guilty that we don't do enough. Help us to find ways to do your will. Guide us when we feel anger against social injustice. Help us to find ways to do your will. Lord, guide those who are in charge of resources. Help them to allocate them fairly and justly. Let them feel the warmth of your presence so that they may do the work of your kingdom. Guide those who would seek profit from pain and misery. Help them to see the error of their ways and let them feel your righteous anger. But let them too feel the warmth of your presence. Guide us to love all of our fellow humans, no matter who they are and no matter what they've done. Help us to rest in your presence knowing that we have ju handed judgment over to you.
so that we can be peaceful and joyous in the work you have set us to do. We ask all of these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Lamb and the Lion, who took the sins of the world. Amen. Thank you.